بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رمضان مبارك brothers and sisters we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for extending our lives to witness this blessed month the month of Quran the month of Siyam the month of Laylatul Qadr. We often misunderstand the fast and misunderstand uh, much of the worship which we perform. There is almost a belief that Allah needs it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in no need of our fast. Because he subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't eat or drink anyway. Uh, he doesn't need Ramadan. He doesn't benefit from people's fast. But it is people who benefit from him and people who benefit from the fast itself. It makes no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether we fast or not. Imagine if you owned billions and billions of countries, empires, planets, and there's a small village, one small village that does not obey you. What would that mean to you? It would be insignificant. And we are less than a speck of dust in this universe, on this small planet of ours. And so this is the first problem really with our mindset. And that is that we think that we are benefiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People want to enjoy themselves, people want to eat and drink, and then they say, okay, you know, I'll do it for Allah. As though it is uh, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs or benefits from. But it is us. Uh, who need to fast. It is us who need the prescription, the medicine. Why? Because it's us who are ill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ And to Allah belong the beautiful names. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's not characterized by anything but beautiful qualities. Who's characterized by ugly qualities? It's us. Envy and hatred, jealousy and greed, oppression, so many different evil, ugly qualities within us. These are the diseases. These are the diseases which need the medication. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not characterized <coughs> by any of these. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is as Sabur, He is as Shakur, He is Al Hakim, the infinitely wise, Jalla Jalalu. And so it's us who need the medicine. The second, uh, the second thing is that these bad qualities, who do they harm? They don't harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they harm us. And so therefore, again, we are the ones who are in need of this medicine. Now imagine if there was a, uh, an, an incurable disease. We all uh, went through corona and our lives were turned upside down in a moment. And how many people, upon learning that there would be a vaccine, rushed to get vaccinated just so they can restore some semblance of normality to their lives. Governments competed for vaccines for their nations. Why? So that their economies can, can uh, improve and, and get back on track. Yes? And so, can you imagine if, la qaddar Allah, God forbid, you have an illness, you have cancer, for example, and you hear that somebody on the other side of the planet has invented or discovered rather a cure for cancer. Who, would, who needs it? The one who has the cancer, not the one who discovered it. Perhaps the person who discovers the cure doesn't have cancer, may never have, may never have cancer. So who is it for but the person who is ill? And so what is worse than cancer, what is worse than any disease is the cancer of sin which is not just destroying the body, but it's destroying our relationship with Allah. It's destroying our relationship with the creation, with our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our friends, our community, our society, the world. The world around us is being destroyed due to the cancer of sin, which spreads and everything it touches, materially and spiritually, is harmed and affected. And so, can you imagine that you have 
an opportunity to own a kingdom greater than this country, greater than this continent, greater than the world, greater than this solar system, greater than this galaxy, greater than this universe. You're given that opportunity to own all of this. And then you say, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll do what I like. And so you're thrown into a dungeon. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity to become kings of our own kingdoms in paradise with no competition, with no rebellion, with no rivals, nothing. Kings for an eternity, a kingdom that doesn't perish and a, a sovereignty, a control, a, a power over your, 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 your domain that never comes to an end. And so we must adopt this mindset coming into Ramadan and that is I need Ramadan, I need the fast, I need to pray. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need any of this uh, from us. So you could even put aside the fact that fasting is fard. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the fact that Allah has made it a fard is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine you refuse to take the medicine and the doctors who have compassion upon you, restrain you, and forcefully give you the medicine that makes you better. And this is an act of mercy. It's like a forced mercy. Because if we don't, uh, if we don't have mercy on ourselves, then sometimes people must intervene to grant us mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't leave the fast to be optional. Out of his rahmah jalla jalalu, he made it an obligation. Why? So we can take that medicine Take the medicine for the diseases of greed and jealousy, the, the diseases of backbiting and envy. Many, many, many different diseases that we suffer from, dear brothers and sisters. The month of Ramadan is a welcome guest, as many uh, say. But really, the guest that comes bearing gifts, you have to invite, you have to, um, you have to host in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way in order to benefit. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he said that uh, the, the Ramadan and the rest of the months of the year, the 11 months of the year, are like Yusuf alayhi salam and his 11 brothers. You see, Ya'qub alayhi salam had 12 sons. Yes, he had 12 sons. And Yusuf alayhi salam was his favorite among those, among those 11. And so just as the 11 sons or the 11 brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they committed many crimes against him. They abused him, they bullied him, they tried to kill him, they decided not to kill him in the end and to banish him by throwing him down a well in order for him to be taken by a passerby, sold into slavery. Whatever happens with him happens, but so long as they get him out of their lives. And then after Yusuf alayhi salam becomes the, the, like the minister, the chief minister of finance in Egypt, and they go to him afterwards, they go to him repentant, remorseful, apologetic. Yusuf alayhi salam accepts their apology and he says, La tathriba alaykum al -yawm. There's no blame on you today. To his 11 brothers, there's no blame on you uh, today. Yaghfiru Allah li wa lakum. Yes, may Allah have mercy upon me and you. And so likewise, we commit sins during the 11 months of the year. And then we come to Ramadan and Ramadan welcomes those whoever presents their sins during the month of Ramadan. Then by virtue of this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the repentance. And not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept the repentance during the other months of the year, but in this month there are more rahmat, more, more maghfira from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more doors are open to qabul, to acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even due to the very little that we do than during the rest of the year. And so likewise, uh, uh, Imam ibn Qayyim, he said that Ya'qub alayhi salam from his 11 sons, after he lost his sight, he cried so much out of sadness that he had lost Yusuf alayhi salam. And it said that, <clears throat> of course, Ya'qub alayhi salam was a prophet. And so he's not going to cry at the death of his son for so long 
uh, some scholars say, rather than Mashaykh, they say that what caused him to cry for, it said, 40 years, that was how long Yusuf السلام, was away from his family, for 40 years and lose his eyesight was his worry that, <clears throat> is my son Yusuf, upon guy, if he is alive, is he upon guidance or not? But regardless of the reason, his sons, for that duration of time, could not benefit him or bring, and all the people he interacted with could not benefit him and bring back his sight to him. But then Yusuf السلام, upon giving his brothers his shirt for their father to put on their face, all he did merely was put the shirt on his face, smell it, and his sight was restored. And so, similarly, we learn from this that a person who a person who wants to be connected to Allah, a person who wants to be connected to Allah, should find the people who are connected. Of course, Yaqub is a prophet. He's never disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for us lowly types, if we want to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we must connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his friends, those who are connected to him. You see, the friend, what is the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you want to go, if you want to go to Birmingham, you need to get on the motorway to Birmingham. You need to get on the road. Now the road will lead you to Birmingham. The road is not Birmingham, but it will lead you to Birmingham. If you want to become a doctor, you have to study medicine. Now your study of medicine, your degree is, is not medicine. It mean, it's not you being a doctor. It will lead you to becoming a doctor. And so likewise, if you want the motorway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning the path that will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is his friends who will guide you to him, Jalla Jalalu. And so this Ramadan, we are encouraged and reminded by the story of Yusuf alayhi salam to find those who will guide us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to those who might, their company might allow us to smell the scent of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To, for our eyesight, but not our physical eyesight, but the sight of the spirit to be restored for us to observe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty, for us to observe Allah the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation, the splendor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his magnificence through his creation. And how is that if you don't befriend the righteous? You see, good people make good people, and evil people make evil people. And if you surround yourself with the righteous, then you will eventually become righteous. What did the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say regarding the companion? He said, uh, he said, a person, المرؤ على دين خليل, a person is upon the religion or the lifestyle, because deen is not just religion. Deen is a lifestyle. It's a way of life. You are upon, meaning you follow and you emulate, you copy the lifestyle and the religion of your Khalil, of your best friend. And so he said, فَلْيَنظُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِلْ Let one of you look and be aware who he befriends. In other words, beware who you befriend. Beware who you befriend. Because, who, as they say, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. And the friend influences. There are only two, uh, there are only two dynamics to this relationship. Either you influence your friends or they will influence you. And so if you cannot influence your friends to do khayr, yes, they may influence you to do sharr, to do evil. And the Prophet ﷺ further went on and said that uh, the, the similitude, the likeness of the, good fr the bad friend and the good friend, the bad friend is like uh, a blacksmith. Now obviously it's not to diminish or to speak ill of that trade and of that craft to be a blacksmith. But the Rasul ﷺ, he said that either, either a spark or some fire burns you, hurts you, or you... Uh, or you smell a bad scent. It's not a great smell, is it? To the, the fumes and the smoke, okay? And so the bad friend will either cause you immediate harm or will, or will harm, you at least, uh, 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 harm you at least mentally, spiritually, that you, you get nothing from them, as I say, but, 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 but bad vibes, yes? And the good friend is like the perfume seller who will either give you perfume and then you'll smell nice, or you smell from him a nice scent. And so that's, the, you become who your friends are eventually. You see, if you work down in the sewer, you'll smell of sewage. You won't be sewage, but you'll smell of sewage. 
You need to know who to, de you need to decide who you surround yourself with. And if you work in a perfume shop, you're not going to become perfume, but you'll smell of perfume. And so we must decide, we must beware and be cautious. Who do we befriend? Who do we surround ourselves with? This is not a, a small issue. People assume that, okay, these are my friends, the people I grew up with, my, you know, my boys, huh? and, uh, and then these are my good friends. These are the righteous companions that I have. The, my friends from the mosque and my friends from school or from the estate or from, you know, from when we go way back. Okay? And maybe these friends are hurting you, are harming you, are leading you astray, are taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there is no way that you can keep both, you, that you can keep both groups of friend, friends. There will be a trade-off. Imagine you want to apply to work in the police service. You want to apply and you want to become a police officer. And so what do they do? They do a background check. They find that, oh, actually, your known associates are gangsters and drug dealers and criminals. And they're not going to let you in. Of course, they're not, they're not going to let you in. You want to work for the, for the army or for the intelligence agents, agencies or something like that. But you associate with hostile foreign forces. Well, they're not going to let you in. And so you want to befriend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet you associate yourself with those who are enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so nobody is saying to you, you need to chuck these friends in the bin. Uh, you know, they could be family members. But what do you do? You maintain a distance. You maintain a distance. And Ramadan helps us to do this. Why? Because during Ramadan, there is, a, there is more of a pull from the mosque. Yes? And there are fewer influences from the shayateen. Right? And so there is more of an impetus, there's, there's more encouragement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to distance yourself from sins and also to distance yourself from the source of sins. The source of sins can be the bad company that you're with. It almost always is the bad company, in fact. Right? And the companion, you know, they say that your five closest friends, they determine who you are. Your five closest friends determine who you are. Your five closest companions determine who you are, right? And today we think that means uh, the friend who I go out to dinner with, who I go to the restaurant with, who I do something with. No, it could be the actor you're watching on TV. He's your companion. You may, you, how many of us spend more time watching YouTubers, TikTokers, Instagrammers? We watch them and spend more time with them than anybody else. Those are our companions. So who are the five people who we spend most time with? And they will, they will shape who we are. And so some people, mashallah, if you ask them, if they were to, if they were to ask themselves, oh, the five people closest to me in my life, oh, it's this sheikh and it's this mufti and this da'i and this imam, then what will happen if you sit with the righteous? you will become, insha'Allah, righteous. And if you sit with the wretched, you'll become wretched. billah. And so, man must associate, we must associate ourselves with the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This Ramadan, this Ramadan, let us go out and look for the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you may ask, what are these qualities of the people of Allah? What are their qualities? The qualities of the people of Allah is that no harm comes from them. That means they don't physically harm people. They don't verbally harm people. They don't talk ill about people behind their backs or even to their faces. They are people who uh, no, no harm. They don't hurt an animal. They don't hurt a plant. They don't hurt an ant or a bee. For no reason, of course. Yes? People who are, people who are, Muslimin. What does that mean, Muslimin? The Rasul defined it. He said, Al Muslimu man salim al Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadi. The Muslim is the one whom the Muslims, the people, are safe and secure, yes, from his tongue and his hands. Meaning that the true Muslim is the one whom no harm comes from. No harm comes from. And then the other quality of the friend of Allah is that only good comes from him and her of course only good comes from them that they are people who you 
when you think of them, you expect goodness from them. You expect goodness from them. And the third quality is that they speak very little. They speak very little. They're not talkative, right? They're not talk talkative. They, their periods of silence are longer than their periods of speech. That when they do speak, you're looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Because their words have value. You see, when we talk a lot, what happens? We devalue our words. We devalue ourselves as well. Like any product you put on the market. Let's say, let's say a mobile phone manufacturer floods the market with its mobile phone, with its device. Because there are so many, the price goes down. The price is low. Its, it's, it's value is low because there, there, you know, there is enough supply and potentially there won't be any demand for it. And so it's cheap. But if they, they drop their product right on the market and in a limited supply to create demand, people rush and race and queue up to buy that product, that device, and it will be expensive and people are willing to pay. Why? Because it's, because, it's, uh, because it's rare, because it's in limited supply. So let your words also be in limited supply, which we'll talk about in the coming uh, lessons and episodes. So the friend of Allah is a person who speaks very little, but when they do speak, there's value to their words. There's wisdom, there's guidance, yes? And there's longing to hear their words. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this blessed month of Ramadan, that he make us of his friends and that we find those who are friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can give us the access. Imagine you want to get close to a king. You want to get close to a king. And so what's the fastest and safest way to get to a king? You befriend somebody who's a friend of that king. They'll give you access. They go in and out of the palace, let's say, without any restriction. They're given and granted an audience with the king. Uh, 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 at will, whenever, whenever they ask. And so if you befriend that person, one day they take you in with them to the palace. They take you in, go see the, the king and you're presented before the king. But in this life, the king, the, the presidents, the millionaires, the billionaires, they have finite resources. They have limited time. And so even their close associates and their friends will not invite everyone, just a select few. Why? Because if they invite everybody, then they, those people will compete, will compete for the resources with them. And so maybe they get less access to the king, less access to resources, etc. But the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not greedy. Because who are they friends with? They're friends with al wasi'ah the vast. They're friends with the infinite, the one who has no end. They're friends with the one who, to whom belong the, the treasures of the heavens and the earth and they do not diminish. They don't decrease. And they can see that. And they love that for themselves and they love everyone to get to know the king of kings, Allah Jalla Jalalu. So they will invite you. And that's why the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although they're quiet, when they speak, it's da'wah. It's an invitation. Not an invitation to themselves but an invitation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So find those people who will take you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not ask you for any money. They will not ask you for any station, for any status. They will not ask you for a lift. They won't ask you for a discount. They won't ask you for anything because they found Allah. And because they found Allah, they have found everything. And so we want to find the limitless, the infinite Jalla Jalalu. And so this Ramadan, we make it our pledge that we will not leave this month until we have found the righteous, the pious, those who meet those qualities, those conditions that we have mentioned. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and to elevate our station and to grant us his acceptance during this month. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ulaik. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon, wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salamu alaykum.